reproductive system. We're going to cover the male reproductive system today. So this list is more just a list of headings, if you want to think of it, like after you go to redo, redo your notes and kind of categorize them, this is sort of the headings that we're going to go through. So as far as the male reproductive system goes, we're going to talk about, in reference to the bladder, and we can see from this image, indeed the ureters are put in the wrong position, as we indicated the other day. The ureters are set kind of high in here. But will the relationship of where the ureters are and the end of the vas deferens is going to be important. So this will kind of be a key takeaway, even though I like this image, although the ureters are not accurate. So we'll begin with the testes. That's where sperm is made. So they're contained within the scrotum, which is just the outer skin covering. It's going to be outside the torso. For ideal or optimal sperm production, the temperature um, of sperm production needs to be lower than normal body temperature. There is a surrounding muscle actually that lines the scrotal skin that actually gives it its wrinkly appearance that helps regulate temperature for the testes. That's actually known as the dartus muscle. Around the testes specifically, so this is the testy portion where we're going to talk about the epididymis later, but the testy portion, it's contained within kind of a more of a rubbery feel capsule known as the tunica albigunia. And then inside the actual part of the testy that's making sperm are the seminiferous tubules. So that's really what we're going to be focusing the majority of our efforts on. So the spermatic cord is the whole component of vessels, nerve, lymphatic vessels, connect tissue that really is within the skin containment but coming up into the torso. So it's between the torso and the testes themselves. That's known as a spermatic cord. Later we're going to talk about the vas deferens which is actually the tube specifically the sperm's going to travel. It's one item in the spermatic cord but the whole bunch is a spermatic cord. And so that's highlighted here where you can just see arteries, veins, nerves, and all of that within there. So that's considered the spermatic cord. That is surrounded by the cremaster muscle, which is another muscle. This is the cremaster that covers all of the testes and opens the spermatic cord. So that actually helps to retract the testes as well for temperature control. On the spermatic cord only, just because most of you guys are going into some sort of healthcare area, Inside the testes, this is the cartoon drawing of a testes sort of sliced open. The drawing just sort of highlights that there are indeed tubules. So these are the seminiferous tubules. If we were to take a slice through them and make a histological slide, this is what it looks like. So one of these is a seminiferous tubule. So each one are seminiferous tubules, and that's what we're going to talk about that actually sperm are produced. On a single seminiferous tubule, we can see, obviously, here's the histology slide and then a cartoon version. And, but you can see that a single seminiferous tubule is here, and that's where sperm is produced, on the inside. But on the outside, in the adjacent cell areas outside the seminiferous tubules are known as Leydig cells or interstitial cells. And there's a slide coming up that has them listed. But it's these cells are not inside making sperm, but they're outside and they're contributing to testosterone production. Who can remember what hormone from the pituitary gland, anterior pituitary, stimulates testosterone production? Luteinizing hormone. Excellent. Yes. Here's another picture, an electron micrograph, where you can see actually the cells within the wall, the seminiferous tubule, you can see the tail of the sperm. Here's a histology slide, again a seminiferous tubule, but then the Leydig cells, also known as interstitial cells, they are up here in the adjacent area, and that's going to be producing and testosterone. So this is a list of cells. We're going to go through the specific items in this list on the slide subsequently, but this one slide is the one that you're going to want to mark and identify because you're going to need to identify each one of these, a spermatogonia, a primary spermatocyte, a secondary spermatocyte, a spermatid, and a spermatozoa. And we'll talk about sustenacular cells, Sertoli cells, and we just talked about these guys, these interstitial cells, and you should write on your notes, and I should have put it here, are the Leydig cells. They're the ones that are on the outside that make testosterone.
What happens in meiosis is we start off with a cell that is 46 chromosomes, so it's two sets of 23s essentially. The 46 chromosome cell is going to replicate itself, 46 chromosome cells, and then those cells are going to split in half so that you end up with four 23 chromosome cells. And on the female side, an egg will go through meiosis and you'll end up with a 23 chromosome cell as well. There, it does do this, however, in the female, it ends up just coming out with one egg, egg from that. So when the sperm and the egg get together, obviously then they become a single 46 cell unit and then that becomes a zygote and we'll talk about that in development. So here's a slide of a seminiferous, a couple seminiferous tubules and then an expanded portion of one. On a single seminiferous tubule, the cells that are going to be out right on the outer edge are known as spermatogonia. And the spermatogonia are 46 chromosomes. They're sort of like the father of the, of the sperm. So they're the start cells, spermatogonia. Then when they start to go through meiosis, the spermatogonia goes, begins to go through its division, and it turns into these cells that are often size-wise a little bit bigger, but the most distinguishing characteristic they have is that the chromosomes are unraveled. So they're inside, it's really a lot of black, squiggly lines. We really see these chromosomes that are because when they're wrapped up in the nucleus, they're wrapped around little histones and they're tight, wrapped all nice and tight and bundled tightly. Well, if you're going to undergo division, cell division, you gotta loosen them all up, unwrap them. So that's what you're really getting in the second level. And these are known as primary spermatocytes. And they also have, are gonna have 46 chromosomes. The primary spermatocytes are under, gonna undergo some division. But visually, they're really looking about the same as the next step of cells that are about the same size and also are gonna have squiggly chromosomes that are free, and those are known as secondary. The secondary spermatocytes are gonna have 23 chromosomes. And so now we have our 23 chromosome cell, and now it's time after we've done all our division to start wrapping things up. So then the next set of cells have a more solid nucleus because all of the loose stringy chromosomes have been now wrapped up around spools and tightened back up and these are known now as spermatids. They also will have 23 chromosomes. So we're tightening them up. They're just a cell now with a more recognizable solid nucleus. And then finally, it condenses even further down and gets even smaller. And the nucleus is so wrapped tightly and all the chromosomes are bundled so effectively that they end up just being little black dots with a little tail that sprouts off. And that would be the spermatozoa. So we can look on the image up here where we go from the spermatogonia the spermatogonia sort of out here on the outer edge. <coughs> then we move inward to more squiggly cells. We can see that up here in a primary spermatocyte. And there's this one very, this one very likely is a secondary spermatocyte just because it's a little further in. But then notice this one where you can see the, the nucleus is a little more solid. It looks like more of a normal nucleus at this point. So that is going to be your spermatid, and then you finally get into, although I don't say spermatid maturation, then you get into the spermatozoa where it's further condensed and then will ultimately get a tail. And when it gets a tail, then it's known as a spermatozoa. I have this picture. They're actually plant cells, I believe. Just to show you the chromosomes, how when you're, you know, going, undergoing, you know, in the one case, metaphase and anaphase, and you're trying to pull them to get a part, you can see how the chromosomes get really stringy. So we're, we're not looking at the ones in the seminiferous tubule as close as this one, but I thought you could see the stringiness of the chromosomes.
You don't have to know this, this is more just me showing you. From the point of the DNA, where the DMA is, you can see where it's wrapped around these little chromatin and histones, and you're really wrapping and bundling so effectively that you actually shrink it down by a factor of about 10,000 until you finally get it into a single a chromosome in there. So you really have a lot of loose things out there that is amazingly and quite effectively packaged up. This is another one where you can see from the top where it goes from the DNA strands, how they wrap up in these histones, they coil around, Kind of then they once they're coiled, then they get coiled again, and then that's what ultimately makes the chromosome. So back to the portion of the seminiferous tubules, we should know spermatogonia, and then we have our primary spermatocytes, our secondary spermatocytes. We end up with our spermatids as we start to consolidate. The nuclei should be more solid than they have drawn here, and then when they finally spread a tail, spermatozoa. The first two will still have 46 chromosomes, and the other will have 23. Those cells are known as Sertoli cells, the Sert or Sustinacular. That's another name for those cells. There are these guys right here. So there's Sertoli or Sustinacular cells. There are, of course, 46 chromosomes because it's just a normal cell. The difference between this cell is that it's not going to become sperm. It's not part of the meiosis process in, in this progression. It's just there as a support cell for the sperm production. So it provides nourishing elements. It can also remove and reabsorb sperm that have had any sort of toxins affecting them and are damaged. So they're really a maintenance type cell they're known as Sertoli cells. Provide nourishment and facilitate the sperm production, but they in themselves will not become sperm. The cells outside here are known as those interstitial cells. Remember, they're <coughs> really known as Leydig cells. Those are the ones that are gonna make testosterone. I'm gonna go back to that other slide. Those are here, the interstitial cells outside of the seminiferous tubules. This one, I tried to label a few of them. This Sertoli cell is here. They tend to be a little bit more triangular shaped, even though that one's a triangle. These are all spermatids. Um, but the Sertoli are a little more oblong or triangular. On to sperm anatomy. So the anatomy of the sperm itself is once we've condensed down all the chromosomes into a hard, dense nucleus, that's what ultimately is the head. So the head is really the nucleus with the 23 chromosomes, and it's going to be packed up in here. But around it, on the outside of it, we have this acrosome, which is sort of this kind of little <coughs> helmet component to the sperm. The acrosome is important after the sperm gets delivered to the female reproductive tract and then the sperm travels up and actually meets an egg. When it meets an egg, the acrosome, it sort of bumps into the egg and the acrosome is discharged in order to try to penetrate the outer barrier, the protective barrier on the egg. So they have to discharge the acrosome in order for the nucleus, the chromosomes, to get into the egg and then ultimately fertilize the egg. So that's why the acrosome is important. The mid piece is really the powerhouse. It's like the motor of the sperm. So the mid piece has a lot of mitochondria in there because this is what actually is gonna give sperm the movement. This is the motor where the tail is actually going to be then moving because sort of like a tail is a, like a whip. It's just an inanimate object unless you put energy into it to cause it to move. And so that's the mid piece's job is actually for propulsion and then it moves the tail and the, the response of the tail is obviously to, to generate forward flow. So the important component to think of is the mitochondria, we don't want it activated. Once sperm is made, we really don't want 
the mitochondria to be propelling it anywhere until the moment of ejaculation. That's because if you're utilizing or producing ATP in the mid piece, ATP production comes at a cost where you can actually have free radicals produced too. It's sort of like a nuclear power plant. You're going to create a lot of power, but you have also some potential harmful agents that can be as a result of it. And it's so close to the nucleus that you don't want to risk any mutation. So you want to minimize the amount of time that this mid piece, this mitochondria, is actually churning out energy. So from the point that the sperm are produced in the testes and then going through the whole pathway that we're going to talk about, it's actually moved along like on a conveyor belt through, to, through muscles by peristalsis. The sperm itself is under self-propulsion only after it's combined with a lot of the seminal fluid that we'll talk about later. So the formation of semen, which is really the fluid plus sperm, has these two main groups. You have the duct system, which is just the pathway that sperm takes from where it's formed. I don't know why the testes makes sperm, and then it's moving through the ducts beyond that, the epididymis, the ductus deferens, also more commonly known as the vas deferens. The ampulla, which is the end of the vas deferens, is going to be the holding storage tank for the sperm until it's ready to leave the body. The ejaculatory duct and the urethra are the pathway of it to go out. We're also going to then talk about the accessory glands that are going to contribute to fluid along the way. So in this picture, we can see the testes outside the body. And then this brown portion that's on the upper outside, just brown in this picture, is the epididymis. So once sperm is made within the seminiferous tubules within the testes, it enters the epididymis, and then there's a whole tubular network. So it's just weaving in and out, and it goes down to the bottom of the testy, and then there's a sharp U-turn, and then it's just a straight shot up, and that's the vas deferens. And then the vas deferens goes up and into the body on the anterior side, goes through your inguinal canal, and then into the torso, over the bladder, and then to the back side of the bladder. And at the end of the um, vas deferens is like a wide area, and that's known as the ampulla. So the epididymis is going to be <laughs> on top and around the side of the testes. So we can see all the seminiferous tubules inside. The tubules of the epididymis is a lot bigger. And so you can just see sperm has a long way to travel. So not only do we make sperm in the seminiferous tubules, but it takes kind of a while for them to mature in a, so that they can actually develop the ability to propel and so on. So they, there's a maturation process of sperm that's required as well. And so the long pathway around here allows for the time for it to do that. So once you get to the bottom, we're at the end of the epididymis, and then once we start on this tube, now we're starting the vas deferens. So the vas deferens is leading from the epididymis all the way up. The end of the vas deferens is known as the ampulla. So it ends at the ampulla, and the ampulla is really the storage area for sperm. So if a man doesn't ejaculate at all, the sperm just hangs out in there, and after a couple months, just reabsorbed by the body. So there's a feedback mechanism within the ampulla that feeds back into the testes. So if sperm is stored there and it's staying there, the feedback to the testes say, hey, you don't need to really make that much more, and slows down production. This actually is the vas deferens. So look how thick, this is all smooth muscle, how thick that is. And in comparison, there's an artery and there's a vein. Like it is huge. So this hugeness of the vas deferens is, you know, you can feel it. So if someone is palpating the spermatic cord, so someone's going to go in for a vasectomy, and you're palpating the spermatic cord, you could, like, by palpating an artery and vein, it's sort of like feeling pipe cleaners in a bag, kind of like it's a thin skin, you can kind of feel, oh, there's something there, pipe cleaners, where the vas deferens would be like, oh, it's like a pencil, like something more rigid and um, of a greater structure because of the large amount of smooth muscle in there.
So the end of the vas deferens, we've already mentioned it here, is the ampulla. So it's the end of the vas deferens. It is the holding tank of for sperm before it's ready to be sent out. So it's this area that's in green. So this is sperm storage before ejaculation. It's just sitting there, nice and quiet. Then we have the seminal vesicle, which although I haven't, have, haven't shown you on our list, is the first of the three glands that we'll talk about. And it's over here. So the seminal vesicle are these glands that are just right next to the ampulla. <coughs> but the glandular components in the seminal vesicle do not mix with sperm until it is on its way out of the body. So upon, at the moment of ejaculation is really when the ampulla lets the sperm out as well as the seminal vesicle letting out its secretions. Together, they will then activate the sperm. But while sperm's just sitting and nothing's going on, the ampulla is separate from the seminal vesicle. First of all, the ureters are wrong. So notice that they did the ureters up high, really high. They're supposed to be way low. So the ureters are bad. The bladder, so this is the back side of the bladder, and we can see the vas deferens coming in here. Oops, a little off there on my drawing. So the vas deferens, and then we can see this wider area as being the ampulla. So it's just a wide area at the end of the vas deferens. And then you can see these glandular components here being the seminal vesicles next to it. The bottom is the prostate, and so it's only upon ejaculation that's within the prostate is when it's going to get mixed up first. So the two groupings that I want you to think of is we did the duct system, is just this is the path that sperm takes. So we've gone up and we're at the point of the ampulla, that's where it's sitting, waiting, not activated. And then it's really these last three, two ejaculatory duct in the urethra that it's going to get mixed with seminal fluid and it's now activated, but it's on its way out. So now we'll go over to the accessory glands to actually figure out what's contributing to it on its way out. So from this slide, we know that we have the ampulla where sperm is at, and then we have the seminal vesicles, which is going to be our main contributor of the fluid. Again, with the ureter not being in the ideal, the proper location. So we have vas deferens coming in, and we have the ampulla, put like a little A, A here. The ampulla there, and the secretions from the seminal vesicles, they will mix, I'll put that in purple. So in purple, they're going to mix together as they go down into the prostate itself. So not only are the seminal vesicles going to add the fluid to mix with the sperm, but then the prostate itself is gonna add its components to the fluid as well. And then, so this is the prostate. It's not on this list, it's on another list, but I'm gonna point it out just because we can see it. These little guys here at the bottom, see those two? Those are known as bulb urethral glands or Cowper's glands. The big picture story on this, as far as the three glands go, is those little bulb urethral glands, also known as Cowper's glands, are at the base of the penis. And what they do is they're the first ones actually to secrete any substance. And what it does is it secretes and allows the fluid to go down through the penile urethra that will neutralize any acidity that might be remaining from any urine because urine's mostly acidic most of the time. You know, people can get pretty alkaline urine if they're really vegetarians, but urine tends to be on the more acidic side. Acidity can cause a lot of damage to the sperm. They don't have any real protection around them. So the Cowper's glands or bulb urethra glands will send a substance that's going to neutralize and sort of pave the way for the, any sperm coming after it. And then it also helps for lubrication. It is upon ejaculation that you're going to get the components from the seminal vesicles and the prostate gland. That's what's going to contribute more to the volume of what's coming out. So the ejaculatory duct is actually the first place that sperm and seminal fluid mix. So now sperm's going to get activated, and that is this little pathway here. So this is a side view. So the other views we saw were straight from the back. And essentially, if we're looking at the bladder, 
and you have the ampullas on two ampullas and then each ampulla has its seminal vesicles next to it, the two together go into, so we have two ejaculatory ducts coming from the side, back part of the prostate to meet up with the prostatic urethra in the middle. So this picture just shows you one of them. So it's coming down to then meet with the prostatic urethra, bringing the blood, the urine straight across. But the ejaculatory duct is back here, meeting up with the prosthetic urethra. This will be where you have sperm and seminal fluid mixed up. You can see it here as well. So we can see up here where the vas deferens comes up and around behind the bladder. So it's sort of part of the ampulla right here. Seminal vesicles cut open. Together they are combined. Here's the ejaculatory duct. This is the prosthetic urethra. So it meets up with the prosthetic urethra, goes across the membranous urethra, and then down the spongy urethra or penile urethra. Prostatic urethra, it's going right to the prostate. Membranous, it leaves the prostate, but it's on its way to the penis, and then it's the penis, penile urethra or spongy urethra. It's known as spongy because of the type of erectile tissue. Seminal vesicles, as we've talked about, are the glands over here next to the ampulla. This is the majority of the secretions that's gonna come out. What's in it is mostly water. Then we have fructose. Fructose is gonna be energy for the mitochondria in the mid piece. And now the sperm motor can get turned on. We now have fuel for the motor and the tails are gonna to start to move. So the sperm will become activated once it's exposed to these seminal vesicles. There are prostaglandins. Those are a type of local hormones that were first named for when they came, the ones that were identified by the prostate gland, but now prostaglandins actually became a whole family of hormones that we can find all over the body, but that was why it has that name. So there are prostaglandins and their purpose is once the, the semen is delivered to the female reproductive tract, sperm's gotta get across the cervix and into the uterus and make its way. And the cervix is usually like, you know, a closed door. So the prostaglandins are there to help soften the cervix and help facilitate entry of sperm into the female reproductive um, system. And then fibrinogen, remember we use that as far as clotting pro components, that kind of gives the seminal fluid the staying power in the sense of sticking it to something. And then that's sort of like the coagulant component where it just stays right near the area of the cervix and that gives more opportunity for sperm to make its trip up across the cervix and into the uterus. The prostate, we saw in the images below, it sits below the bladder. The urethra travels right through the middle of it, that's the <coughs> prosthetic urethra. It's about 20 or 30 percent of the seminal fluid and it helps sperm motility and helps also to buffer acidity. So it's neutralizing the acidity of the vaginal environment. Female reproductive tract is very acidic because the vagina opens up to the outside world and to minimize bacterial infection, it's got a really low pH in there. I think difficulty for sperm is the acidity of the female reproductive tract. So part of the seminal fluid is to help protect sperm that way. So from this view, we can see the testes epididymis we have the vas deferens kind of coming up and around here's our vas deferens and then we have the ampulla there in green our seminal vesicle there in red purple for our ejaculatory duct and then you get the prosthetic urethra membranous urethra spongy or penile urethra just a real quick thing so on your lab practical you should expect to see a seminiferous tubule. Name the cells from it, spermatogonia, primary spermatocyte, secondary spermatocyte, spermatid, spermatozoa. Know which ones are 46, know which ones are 23. Sertoli cell, Leydig cell. So you should know all those, that's just on one slide. So as long as you can see that slide and say, I can spot these on a picture, or I know about them, and then a picture like this. It's got all the basic components of amino anatomy. So these are the two kind of big things. And then, then obviously like question details will be, you know, which gland contributes the majority of seminal fluid, you know, and that would be the seminal vesicles or things like that. So some of the details, but just the main things you're gonna identify like on a practical, you should look at, see something like this.
The next few slides are just going through the glands individually. So the Cowper's glands are the bulb urethral glands. Those are the two little ones that are at the base of the penis. It's going to be a real alkaline fluid. Again, that's going to combat the acidity, neutralize any remaining urine, add some lubrication, and that's so it's really the first secretions that begin upon arousal. This view is a frontal slice. So we can see here is a really nice view of the Cowper's glands themselves. Right here, we have the prostate up here, so you can see those two. You're not gonna see the seminal vesicles from here because they're on the back side. And so we're looking at a slice from the anterior view. And then this here is the base of the penis here. So we can see where the prosthetic urethra is to membranous urethra and then the start of the spongy or penile urethra. So now that we had all the glands and we went through all the tubes, we have semen. Semen is the seminal fluid plus sperm together, about 90% water, 10% sperm or less. It could even be a greater proportion of water and contributing fluids. So we have the fructoses for energy to move that mid-piece, real alkaline to combat vaginal acidity. We're going to have buffering salts, but mostly prostaglandins. It's going to be in there to help our female reproductive system to allow sperm to come in. On the penis itself, obviously it's for urine transport out of the body and semen transport out of the body. There are, obviously there are urethra that goes through, but there are three strands along the length of the penis of erectile tissue. Two specific strands are dedicated to, on the dorsal surface, that are called corpora cavernosa, and there is one that surrounds the urethra, corpora spongiosum. You can see on this picture on the side, we have corpora spongiosum, it's more of the orangish color, and the cavernosa is here in purple. It doesn't really do it justice. The cavernosa here is the purple one, and the spongiosum is here. This odd little face-like structure, so if you're thinking of it as a weird little face, is the little mouth part, that's the urethra. And so around it is going to be corpora spongiosum. So although it's erectile tissue, its job also is not only to maintain erection, it's also to prevent collapsing of the urethra, is also to protect it, to make sure it doesn't get obstructed. The corpora cavernosa are the two big purple parts, the little dots in the middle that look like eyes, um, are the dorsal arteries that are bringing blood in. And so those are the, sorry, I have a few more pictures here. So you can see this here that gives a sense of the, um, the long cylindrical components. This is an actual histology slide, not just the cartoon. So you have the usually dorsal arteries right about in the middle, corpora spongiosum, here's the urethra there. Put it in, in your notes because you don't have to know it for your test. But what an erection ultimately is, is arterial dilation. You want blood going in. And so what happens is blood goes in, into the corpora cavernosa and the spongiosum, but there's more space in the cavernosa and they're on the dorsal surface. And so you have high pressure going in. And as some of the fluid kind of escapes out into the cavernosa space, then around it, there's also a tunica albigunia that I mentioned is around the testes, but there's also a component around the erectile tissue of the penis as well. And so that, when it gets encroached on by the pressure of the arterial side, it actually constricts on the venous side. So not only do you have high pressure driving in, but you're obstructing flow out. And so it's really a parasympathetic activation process. As much as there is parasympathetic activation, there has to be sympathetic inhibition. So ED, being erectile dysfunction, really starts from ED endothelial dysfunction. Remember, the endothelium is the innermost layer of the blood vessel. The endothelium helps produce nitric oxide. And in trying to figure out ways to cause vasodilation and help people that are heart patients to increase blood flow, they discovered Viagra because it's a nitric oxide promoter. And so that's how they were like, we got this weird side effect here on these folks. And so Viagra was born and it started out being a heart medication. But the issue is enough nitric oxide to cause vasodilation, but then you have to have then venal, venous occlusion. And that's the main thing. Arousal is a parasympathetic driven process. However, <coughs> orgasm and ejaculation 
is an immediate takeover of the sympathetic nervous system. Here's another image of the anatomy that you can actually see. The tunica albicunia here that wraps around the cavernosa. But this picture, you can see that they're more like long cylindrical strands. The last thing we're going to go through is the hormonal regulation. From the anterior pituitary, there are two hormones. The two hormones that you need to know are going to be follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Follicle stimulating hormone. Follicle stimulating hormone is going to target the spermatogonia cells. Follicle stimulating hormones and target spermatogonia cells to make sperm. Luteinizing hormone is going to target the Leydig cells or the interstitial cells outside of the semi-necros tubules to make <coughs> testosterone. In females, follicle stimulating hormone is going to stimulate the cells that are going to make an egg. And in females, luteinizing hormone is going to stimulate the cells that will make estrogen. So they have parallel functions. That's obviously just specific to the gender. Another slide cross-section of the seminiferous tubule. We have from the anterior pituitary in blue, the follicle stimulating hormone is going to target spermatogonia, which are around the outer portion of the seminiferous tubules and the action of sperm formation. On the green side, luteinizing hormone from the anterior pituitary is going to target the Leydig cells that are outside of the seminiferous tubules for testosterone production.